Okay, we'll call, I'll call this meeting to order. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to begin by apologizing. We've had about eight hours of straight meetings, uh, non-stop meetings, and, and unfortunately the agenda keeps, keeps us uh, sometimes a couple of minutes late. Our apologies for starting a little bit late. But good evening to you all. My name is Richard Stewart. Uh, I'm the Mayor of Coquitlam, and on behalf of City Council, I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. This is a public hearing into the bylaws that will be introduced to you in a moment by the Deputy City Clerk. Council for City of Coquitlam has given first reading to these bylaws and has asked that a public hearing be held. Uh, how this will work is uh, we'll begin with an item and staff will, from the City's Planning and Development Department, will present a summary of that proposed bylaw and then we'll open the floor to anyone who's present that has wants to share his or her views about the proposed bylaw. Those that have pre-registered will be given the first opportunity to speak before we open the floor to everyone else that's uh, in attendance. I stress to you all that this is a public hearing. It's an opportunity for anyone who has a view on the proposed bylaw to make that view known to council members. Council members are here with an open mind and are here to listen to your input. No one has prejudged the outcome of these applications. But there are some rules. It isn't a question and answer period, and it's not an opportunity to debate the merits of the proposed bylaw with either council members, with staff, or with anyone in attendance who might not share your view. So we ask you to restrict your comments to the proposed bylaw, be as brief and concise as possible. We're asking speakers to limit themselves to five minutes. You can speak more than once if you've got some good stuff, but you've got to get back to the back of the line, and we'll, that way everyone will get a chance to speak. Uh, please be respectful of each speaker and allow that speaker to make his or her points without interruption and that means please refrain from clapping, yes, and from also booing, from jeering from uh, any of the presentations that take place tonight. As Chair of the meeting, I reserve the right to conclude any presentation that doesn't relate to the bylaw before us, that becomes abusive or that becomes repetitive of views that that person has already made known to council members. And please note, if you have a written submission that you wish to be part of the permanent record, you have to hand it to the clerk's desk prior to the adjournment of that item. After the adjournment of that item, council can receive no further information about that item until we give it forth reading, or, or not. But we, we have to be able to, we can't receive any information after the public hearing ends. Immediately following adjournment of the public hearing, we'll have a regularly scheduled council meeting uh, in order that Council can give consideration to a number of items on the Council agenda, but also to all the items on tonight's public hearing agenda. Yeah, however, if Council wishes to, any, uh, if we have more information we need or something, we may suspend the decision-making process for an item that's on tonight's agenda uh, and deal with it at a subsequent Council meeting. I'll now call upon Ms. Lohr to introduce the, bylaw, uh, the first bylaw on tonight's agenda and the Planning and Development staff to give a presentation on the first item. Thank you, Your Worship. The first item on this evening's agenda is an application to amend the city's zoning bylaw for the properties at 953 and 969 Charland Avenue. We're planning staff to provide a presentation. There we go. Now, Councillor Sikora has clearly heard my preamble before because he didn't come in until it was done. <laughs> Thank you very well much. Done. <laughs> not, not if I wanted to miss that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember it when it's your turn to speak. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Chris Jarvie, Development Planner with the City of Coquitlam, and I'm here tonight to present a rezoning application for five properties located at the northwest corner of Charlotte Avenue in La Blue Street. The addresses are of, um, of the properties are 953, 959, 961, 965, and 969 Charlotte Avenue. The zoning in the area is a mixture of SS1 service commercial, C2 general commercial, CS1 service commercial, P2 special institutional, C1 local commercial, RT1 two family residential, and RS1 one family residential. The properties are designated medium density apartment in the Austin Heights neighborhood plan of the official community plan. Do you have rotate on here? Oh. 
sorry. Thank you. Uh, the applicant is proposing to build a new four-story apartment building on the subject site. The building will be comprised of 88 units, 38 one-bedroom, 52-bedroom units, and three of these units will be adaptable. To facilitate the development, the applicant is seeking to amend the zoning of the site from RS1 one family residential to RM3 three-story or sorry, multi-story apartment residential. Staff's recommendation is to give second and third readings to bylaw 4335 2012. Should council grant second and third readings, staff would bring forward at a later date for council's consideration a development permit that would address the form and character of the development. Thank you. One moment, please. Ms. Lohr, could you put it back to, oops, yeah, you finally yeah. got this one right. Can we put it back to the, uh, to the adjacent zonings, uh, which I think is slide two? Um, you opened your comments with um, that the adjacent zone, oops, I think it's going to work out. One more. That the adjacencies were SS1. Is, is, is you meant SS2? Sorry, it is SS2. Oh, okay. Just, just yes. clarifying so no one says we said something wrong. Okay, Thank you. so it was SS2. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Councillor Reed. <clears throat> uh, through you to staff, what is the parking? I don't see it in any of my. The. It's not in any of my information. Yeah, it's, um, uh, Your Worship, it's uh, fully underground parking, 131 stalls required, 132 stalls provided. So they fully comply with the parking requirement. I thought you'd put that in because it would make me happy. <laughs> put an extra space in so you can visit more often. Cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I have three speakers on the speakers list, beginning with the applicant, uh, who may or may not, not wish, they may just have registered, but if they do wish to speak, it's uh, John O'Donnell. I'm letting in McAllister. Please come forward. Their address of record is 1285 West Pender in Vancouver. Good day, John. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my name, I am John O'Donnell, and I'm a senior vice president at Letting and McAllister Communities Limited. Uh, with me today are Kaylin Cross, the development manager at Letting and McAllister, and beside Kaylin is Shannon Seafelt of RCA Architects, the project architect. Letting and McAllister is pleased to be working again in Coquitlam. Uh, it has been over 15 years since we completed Deercrest in the Westwood Plateau. Uh, I, I will keep my uh, talk short tonight because I do appreciate Council's put in a eight hours already today. In the last 15 years, Sledding and McAllister has been busy in most municipalities of the Lower Mainland, constructing townhomes, low-rise apartments, and high-rise apartments. We have been building close to the city of Coquitlam. In 2009, we completed Northgate, which is a mixed-use uh, residential and commercial project at the corner of Cameron and North Road. Uh, right across the street from Coquitlam, and many re Coquitlam residents, I'm sure, shop there at the uh, grocery store, drugstore, and the liquor store. Uh, we are currently constructing our first six-story wood frame project right on Royal Avenue, across from Coquitlam. Or, sorry, across from New Westminster City Hall. Uh, this relatively new building form will allow more efficient utilization in urban centers. Tonight, after a nine-month collaborative process with city staff, we are pleased to present our plans for two four-floor four apartments on Charland Avenue in Coquitlam. Although the RM3 zone permits buildings up to eight floors in height, we have chosen to present a building with the minimum height allowed, which is four floors. We believe that this height is more in keeping with the height proposed for, for the character of this part of the neighborhood and the three-floor buildings that the Austin, Height, Austin Heights neighborhood plan envisions in the area on the south side of Charland. We are well aware that Council prefers there be few variances to the RMZ, RM3 zoning schedule, but we have two. We are requesting a consideration of variance to permit higher site coverages as part of our parking garage is included in the building footprint. This increases our coverage from 54% for the buildings, uh, for the apartment, to 65%, which is 10% more than the RM3 permits. Our site slopes nine feet from the lane north, uh, from the lane to the north down to Charland. 
as with many sloped sites, we have located the height of the main floor of the buildings just below the high side of the site, so that the north-facing homes would be not too far below the lane. The main floor of our proposed buildings is actually within a few feet of most of the main floors of the existing houses on our site now, because they have been built up the existing slope. One of the newer homes, 953 Charland, is very similar to our proposed form. It has a garage at grade level, with, level with the street, and then two floors above it. We have worked closely with city staff and our landscape architect to ensure the parking garage blends into the slope of the site. Landscaping is bermed up and there are many small stepped retaining walls. The building length has been a difficult issue. The RM3 zone states the maximum length is 37 meters, about 121 feet, with various variances in vision possibly up to 55 meters or 180 feet. We struggled with this because in our industry it is not uncommon to have 90 units or more in one frame building that is over 75 meters wide. We also felt that if we were proposing an eight floor building, which is the maximum permitted in this zone, it should be narrow, narrower, of course. But if we were building the, to the minimum height, then a wider building could be considered because it has less impact on the neighbors across the street. Earlier this year, we met extensively with staff and after considering all the issues, we submitted detailed architectural landscape plans for one building with a recess at the center to break up the building. However, when reviewed by internal staff at our staff review committee, this approach was rejected. We were advised that staff would only support two buildings on the site, but would consider a link between the two buildings to have the amenity area. We went back to the drawing boards and looked at ways to make the building narrower and deeper. We, one approach we looked at con consisted of five floors of apartments facing Charland and four floors facing the lane. This would have eliminated both the variance for the building length and pushed the parking garage three or four feet dip, deeper into the ground to eliminate the variance for site coverage. However, we felt that the five floors facing Charland would not be popular with the residents across the street. This also pushed the building into the extra costs of complying with the five to six floor wood frame building rules. We believe every new community should have a mix of housing types and I believe it is important to stay with the four floors to keep our costs and prices much lower than the nearby concrete high rises. Now we have two buildings with a significant gap between them and yet they still require a minor variance of 1.65 meters for one building or 7.28 for another or as the report mentions because we put the amenity link between the two buildings in one sense they are all considered one building at the ground floor so in fact they're I think in the text of the zoning they're actually listing a larger variance. Uh, here is the rendering of the proposed building. I believe there was a snippet on the, uh, we could get it on the drive. Well, we, we believe we've worked hard to provide a handsome addition to the Austin Heights neighborhood, one that will, has in, um, brick, and very substantial materials and will provide an enduring housing for many years to come. I thank Council for the opportunity of allowing me to speak to, to Council and the community tonight and I would be pleased to answer any questions Council might have. Okay, we've got questions from Councillor Reed. Thank you. Um, first question is the outside finishing. Mm -hmm. It's getting taller as I sit here. <laughs> there it is. No, I like it better this way than the high rise. <laughs> the outside finishing, is that brick I see? Yes, it's brick columns and some brick panels along the exterior. Okay, and is that hardy board? And there's hardy panel and hardy board. Okay, so I like the brick. Okay, next question is um, regarding elevation. Um, with the garage behind you, behind the lane, how are you going to be more than one story or one and a half stories above the garage? Um, okay, so the, you're referring to our parking garage and not the... No, I'm talking about the garage behind you, the Petrocan, I believe it is. Yes. Sorry. So when the building is completed, 
how how many stories would I see from the other side of Austin too? Uh, okay, so I believe the laneway is a retaining wall of about it six is. feet high yeah. on the Petrocan side, and then the Petrocan is a one-story building, but it's probably around 20 feet high. So you're looking at about 28 feet for, uh, for the height of the Petrocan, and then our building is. Uh, about 45 feet, I believe. Oh, about two stories. You'd see two stories see, projecting yeah, yeah. above, that's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Donnell. I'm having a hard time finding on uh, any of the sketches, the maps, diagrams, where the entrance to the parking garage would be. I can't see it anywhere. Okay, uh, if we could Maybe put you the, site, uh, the colored landscape plan. Uh, actually, I brought one. So there's an implied question there. Are you able to show it to me? <laughs> and uh, so for council's benefit, this is uh, Charland Avenue along the, the lower part of the drawing, and yeah. the lane is to the top part of the drawing. Yeah. And uh, Le Bleu is over on the very far side of the drawing, and the entry is on the very west side of the site. Yeah. Uh -huh. As close to Blue Mountain as you ah, can. I see it there now. It's on the sorry, it's on the Charlin side, on the very west side. Great, see it now. Thank you. That's all. Okay. okay I have one more. You sure Thank you, Councillor Councillor Hodge. Okay, so I'm, I'm, my questions are again uh, around the parking. And did I, I think I read this or you just said that we're looking at some places at two story parking at the back? Is it two stories in places uh, or is it one right across? At the lane side, the roof of the parking garage is about two feet below the lane and goes down two stories into the ground on the lane side. Right. And then on the street side, the roof of the parking garage is about six feet except for where the entry is, we, we drop the roof along the street, along Charlin side to be about six feet above the street with retaining walls, etc., stepping up and screening it. Try to hide it, okay. And, and I'm just wondering the decision not to go deeper with the parking, just to try and thus reduce some of the site coverage, is that due to the uh, contamination soil? The, the, it's, it's probably a number of aspects. Is uh, if we went deeper, we would be lowering the entire building in the ground, which would put the homes on the lane side more than, you know, say if we went an extra four feet deep, they'd be five feet below the lane, which isn't that, that attractive, especially since on the other side of the lane is the retaining wall and future high density homes. And then yes, eventually, as we worked our way through with Petrocan, uh, that going down much deeper, we would be getting near a point where we our footings might touch some of the environmental material that is uh, entering and flowing down the slope from Petrocan site. That would be, the, for lack of another word, the contaminated soil or soil that may need remediation? Well, well strangely enough, it, it's within the Petrocan site, there's contaminants lodged there, and then they, because some of it's uh, uh, petroleum-based, the vapors and and tiny bits enter the water, which of course the whole, all of Coquitlam is going down the hillside. And uh, they also interact with the soil as they flow down and create manganese and other things. So they're always going down and, and really below our site, uh, they're considered on uh, minor amounts. And because eventually, well actually Petrocan is in the process of going through the remediation of the site. Once the site's removed, those products will stop flowing down and eventually clear out from the ground, say, uh, 20 feet below our site. Okay. So the Ministry of Environment then says if, if that's the condition and you can keep all your footings at least a meter away from any, any of where these contaminants might be carried, then you're allowed to proceed and get a certificate of compliance, which so everything is vetted by the Ministry and they say that uh, it's acceptable to issue a, a certificate that essentially says the site where our building sits is, is uh, suitable. Okay, good, thank you. Good. Councillor Sakura. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Square footage on your uh, one bedroom and two bedroom units, what the square footage in? Uh, I think our one bedrooms were shooting for around 6, 620 to 660, 620 oh, square feet for a one bedroom. Yeah. To 620 up to uh, 680. 620 to 680? 620 to 680 for yes. one bedroom. One bedrooms. And two bedrooms? The two bedrooms, there's probably some smaller two bedrooms around 760 and then they'll range up to about 860. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Reed again. Yeah, those aren't the same square footages that staff gave us, so I obviously you've changed the plan. Um, my other big complaint is loading bays. Do you have one here for moving in and out? We do. Oh, where is it? It is right on uh, Charlin. So we've combined along the streetscape, we've combined a loading bay right near the parking entry where the trucks can back in, actually a lovely little corridor to the elevator. And uh, actually one of the things we, because of the younger active crowd we, we envision living here, we've actually combined kayak storage near the loading bay so people oh, can drive their cars okay. up and load kayaks. They can also, there's bike storage level with the loading bay so people can back into the loading area, put their bikes on and uh, go and then at the same time the, this same space can be used by the garbage truck when they pick up so they're not picking up on the street. Perfect and your water feature is it something I would swim in or is it just a tiny little thing? It's uh, well we could swim if there's people are celebrating the new building and jumping in the fountain. Uh, no it's a decorative feature and it's actually of uh, here I'll show up the rain drain. A decorative feature and that was a rhetorical question wasn't it yes yeah. <laughs> it's not an well it's a visual amenity but not a physical amenity Is okay that a, that's good that's all i need uh so right by the front door there's an upper tank with a waterfall dropping to a lower tank oh, and then pretty. it spills sideways down to another tank and drops yet again to a lower tank and uh, so it'll create some animation near the entry and some um, white noise some water noise and yeah. uh it's something actually, Ward, Mc, Ward McAllister, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, the president and CEO of our company, loves the water features. So it's become sort of uh, something that we are doing in all our, our projects, and uh, we're mindful of the long, -time ma long term maintenance. But I think they add a little animation to, this, to the streetscape, and actually, we're pleased to sort of bring it near the sidewalk so as people are walking by, they, they can enjoy it. Okay, thank you. And I could remind Councillor O'Neill that we didn't ask for kayak storage. <laughs> but if you're going to provide a waterway, you better provide a storage for the kayaks. <laughs> Councillor Robinson on kayaks. Thank you. Uh, I actually do have a couple of kayaks at home. And Storing them is always a challenge, even in a single-family resident. Um, I'm, um, the numbers that we have in the report for the um, one-bedroom and two-bedroom are different, as well as the site plan. And I just want to get a sense of which is the more accurate. I'm, I'm assuming that there have uh, been some changes. Well, actually, I, I could, if I could, I'll just get the latest stats because I'm. Th that would be I great. Apologize. Sorry for the delay. Um, so our one bedrooms and actually, I mean, part of it is we are sort of refining the plans as we go along, uh, trying to, you know, improve the mix. So we've got, uh, 
Actually, the one bedrooms are larger. I apologize. There, there are a few, uh, well, so there's 22 of them that are 607 square feet that we're looking at, probably around 610. And then there's some at 683. Uh, there's this uh, one, and plus those, some of those are one in dens. There's 683, 673. Um, so that's sort of the range for the one bedrooms. And then the two bedrooms, uh, Largest looks to be 833, oh sorry, no, there's a three bedroom at 946. There's one of those, sorry. And then there's some um, other two, larger two bedrooms in that range. So I apologize for not having precise numbers for council, um, but if, if you wish, for the terms of the bylaw, um, just go with the numbers that are in your, in your booklet. Oh. And uh, as part of the development permit, I believe staff yeah reviews the unit plans to ensure they comply in all ways? No, it's just, it's just fine. I was just following up on Councillor Socorro's question and I was looking through the report and the numbers are a little different and I just, yeah. I'm assuming we'll get the most recent numbers. When Mr. Alloway. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, it, it is a matter of um, uh, the report before uh, Council is the preliminary zoning report. Uh, the project is evolving. Uh, the fine. developers look at their marketing numbers, the mix. Uh, we do expect that that evolves all the way through to the final DP. Uh, development permit, I should say. So, um, we're council to uh, authorize the project to proceed tonight. Um, and one of the conditions would be that a development permit would have to come back in front of council. At that point, we'd have the final development permit design with the final unit numbers right. for council. Right. So, but we're looking at about 88 units. That's correct. So that's sort of yes. the, the intention. So, um, I had I'm the one who'd asked about. Um, adaptable, making mm -hmm. some of these units adaptable. And um, we got a response back because I was asking, well, what, what would it take to make them 100% of them adaptable? Because I feel like I'm, I keep getting tossed a bone. Well, we'll just throw Councillor Robinson one or two adaptable units and that should shut her up for a while. And I'm getting a little antsy, um, especially given that Port Coquitlam um, has recently um, looked at making 30% of anything over, I think, 10 units. 30% uh, have to be adaptable. Um, but also listening to you talk about marketing, um, this is, I guess, one of my concerns, um, and I just want to hear from you a little bit about that. You're talking about, you know, kayaks for the younger set, and um, I guess I'm concerned because when we looked at um, changing this whole plan and looking at the Austin Heights plan, it was a, a lot of it was about aging in place. So I'm concerned not so much about the kayaks, but the walkers and the wheelchairs and the, um, and so um, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to look at increasing some of the adaptab adaptability uh, for, um, for, this, for this unit, for this, this project. Okay. So thank you. That's all the only question I had. Okay. That's it for us. And thank speaking you. Speaking up on behalf of those who consider themselves younger and who are over 50 and who would love kayaking. Um, I'll just explain quickly uh, for the audience, there are several, pro several stages to a process like this. Uh, council gives first reading, that sends it to a public hearing, that's tonight. If council gives second and third reading, it then goes through another process that, where the plans get fine-tuned, generally speaking, in relation to those comments, in many cases in relation to the comments made at the public hearing by council members or by the public. And so the plans aren't finalized yet, even if the project does proceed, um, there will be tweaking. So, seeing no other questions for staff, we'll go to the next speaker. We have Beverly Sewers at uh, 968 Charland Avenue, Beverly. Hi, I am Beverly Sewers and I live at uh, 968 Charland Avenue. And this has been a nice uh, uh, community uh, and now we're having apartment buildings come in. I think this rezoning is ridiculous. I think it doesn't fit the neighborhood whatsoever. Um, it uh, will change my property values. Um, I don't think anybody I know would want to buy a house across from a rectangle box that's aesthetically unpleasing to the eye. Um, it's disrupted our whole neighborhood. Um, I've looked at their uh, plans and their uh, measurements. All their measurements are over scale, both height and width. 
Um, they say it's going to be a four-story building, but part of their garage is over and above uh, on Charlotte Street, over and above. So that building will be almost a five-story building. I live right across the street with a flat roof with a deck on it, and everybody over there is going to be staring right down at me. There is no parking in our neighborhood as of the last number of years, and I don't understand how an 88 unit can come into our neighborhood and they say that they have adequate parking. There's 88 units, you figure there's one to two people in those units. Where are those people that come to visit these people come and where are they gonna park? There's gonna be building for two years, which is gonna disrupt our whole neighborhood. I don't know anybody on my side of the street that's happy about this. Um, I originally bought this house because I have a daughter going to university for seven years and I wanted to stay there. I do not want to live in a construction zone. And it's not a pleasing unit. It is a rectangle box. And it, it, they originally said in building plans for these type of buildings that it was supposed to be built from east east to west and they're building it from north to uh, north to south. Anyways, they're doing all the building the opposite way in which they were supposed to build it. Um, and now, because they're trying to get away with this, oh, it's not just one rectangle box. They're putting this little something right in the center of it. In essence, it's still a rectangle box. And what I don't understand is why would there be rezoning on that side of the street and we who came into that neighborhood and bought houses for our families, growing families, that you would buy one side of the street and totally change it all up and have a, apartment buildings and on our side we have normal houses. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I'm just looking at my notes to see what else I want to say. That's what one of my biggest things is I just don't understand why, why they would even consider doing this. It just seems so inappropriate for this type of neighborhood that they would come in and just do this because all of us on the other side are now at the effect of all of this. And it, it's not even a pleasing looking building. And then you're going to have the bays, the, the loading bays in the front on Charlotte. Why wouldn't it be at the back of the building? Why would we have to watch all that loading in and loading out? And then we on our street have got to, they say it's going to take 14 months to uh, build this. Anybody who knows construction knows that that's not going to happen in 14 months. It's going to be about a two year gig and I'm going to be living in the middle of it. And there's no parking now. We've had a couple of houses on our street already built and they've done their driveways right out to the street. There's no shoulders on our street. I've already phoned the engineers. I've already spoke to the engineers about this and they say I can't do anything about it. So anybody who comes into our neighborhood, there's no shoulders on our streets and there's no parking for guests that come to my house or the next door neighbor's house and we're going to build an 88-story building and leave the rest of the street like that. I feel like um, a lot of the people on that side got bullied out of it, but it was still their choice to, um, to sell these places. I think it's inappropriate. I think it's totally inappropriate for the neighborhood, and especially a building that looks like that. That place is going to hover, hover, hover over and above stories above my place. Plus the other thing is because this is going high enough, we're going to be shadowed on that side of the street. It's a nice sunny street. We have lots of sun. It's really, really quiet. With 88 units coming in, you think of the traffic that's going to create. I just don't get it. And I don't get why this ever would be approved. I opposed this from the beginning. I said nay to this from the very beginning. And this building, I just don't get it. And their measurements are all off, how they're building this, how they're, they're appeasing with putting something in the center of it. 
And then they're saying that they're building for the, all the young people and they can come in. Well, it's not a young people neighborhood. It is a middle aged to aging neighborhood. So I don't get it. And my main concern is this, the parking. I don't know how anybody's gonna straighten that out. We don't have sidewalks, we don't have shoulders now. You put another 88 units on our street, what are we gonna do? And I, I heard you say, Mary, that this was not a question thing, but I have a curiosity about they've been saying that they're going to, because it's a cul-de-sac that they're gonna build the road through, so I don't know who to ask that question to, but I know I, that that's... I can find out the answers to okay. it. When, when, when there's a legitimate question comes up, and I'm gonna direct that one straight to staff. The, uh, are there any plans to change the uh, road, routing of streets? And at this point, I guess we're only talking about the... Uh, the uh, and what's going to happen to us when all this construction, if this just construction does go? Sorry, just a second, please. Mr. Uh, yes, I worship. Um, Charland uh, currently, I'm not sure if the clerk can maybe put up the aerial photo that's part of that package. Might be easier to um, talk to that. Uh, so I think it's the first slide. That's not helpful. That's the wrong one. Um, Um, there's, a, there's a bulb at the end. Of is, the yes, uh, the aerial would, uh, if we can put that up, uh, I think it's before that. But in any event, um, uh, there's um, the, the air photo is it, uh, it's the first one. There you go. There it is. Okay. okay. Thanks, uh, Kerry. So that uh, you can see the, the currently there's a cul-de-sac, which, which is uh, essentially a one-way system out to Blue Mountain. Um, the intent under this application is to open up um, Charlotte to Le Bleu, but only uh, for ingress from Le Bleu. So you're heading down Le Bleu, and you're going to be able to get into Charlotte as a one-way. Um, it won't, it will not, and it will be open for emergency access from Charlotte to Le Bleu, but it will not be open for um, movements between Charlotte heading east and up to Le Bleu. Um, the idea is that um, from transportation planning. Um, uh, we do not want to open up Charlotte and Le Bleu to, to you know, traffic running through the neighborhood. It's intended to provide an, an ingress to the uh, residents on Charlotte. Um, so southbound Le Bleu, right now um, Charlotte is not open to you. If you head down Le Bleu, that will be open as a right turn into Charlotte uh, southbound on Le Bleu, but only as one way. And what's the control mechanism? Uh, there will be some design, uh, there will be a one-way system, a chicane kind of system with uh, signage um, and uh, there will be some, we've done some preliminary assessments with our transportation uh, operations, there will be some signage on there and, and some, uh, also some bollards that will be placed for facilitating um, full emergency access to, uh, for heading eastbound, northbound. Okay, yeah, you've got questions from Councillor O'Neill. Yes, just on behalf of the uh, presenter, thank you for all that. Um, I want to seek some clarification from staff. Uh, first, um, uh, she was mentioning about the uh, siting of the buildings, and I believe that the Austin Heights design guidelines suggest that buildings should be sited north-south. I think that's what you're trying to say. And, and this build, these two buildings are are east-west. Um, and so, is there some um, answer to her query about why this was done or allowed? The, um, yes, Your Worship, um, the design guidelines are intended to try to create a, the, the, the optimal balance between the site itself, the assembly put together, um, promote sun penetration. There's a range of guidelines designed both for the to support the neighborhood center, uh, which is high-rise forms, mid-rise forms, and then there's some specific guidelines around um, the four-story medium-density apartment. This particular designation, medium density apartment in this area, is limited to a small number of properties south of uh, uh, the neighborhood center. In this particular area, it is challenging um, to achieve a very direct north-south orientation of buildings. Um, the city did work with a proponent to try and mitigate the, uh, the length of the building, uh, try and push this into essentially a two-story building mass. We have, uh, over time, um, looked at this project as a, as a good contributor to the affordability to this type of land use in this area, support the land use. Uh, the overall design characteristics of the project, the quality of the project, the treatment, um, we feel are, are satisfactory. But with this range of properties and the length of, of assembly that was obtained, as well as the fact that this developer had to assemble an additional property 
um, the, the, the westernmost property was originally alienated by the two assemblies in the area. There's another proponent with two properties further to the, to the west. And this developer did make substantial efforts to acquire the, the last remaining property, which is their fifth property, which then created some uh, challenges for them in terms of creating efficiencies for that acquisition. So we, we've traded off a number of objectives. We do feel that the design and character and form and mass of the building is still um, quite reasonable based on the, uh, on the designation of the, and, and the policies in the area plan. Okay, and she was also asking about an issue that uh, might puzzle some members of the public, why the uh, zoning on one side of the street would be one thing and the zoning on her side of the street was yes. still single family. How does that come to pass? Um, uh, to the clerk, if I could just have you put up the official community plan. I think it's the next slide, please. Uh, one after that, I think. There you go. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so if I can just draw your attention to the designations on the, on the OCP, this is uh, essentially the official community plan. It's, uh, it mirrors the Austin Heights neighborhood plan that was adopted by Council about a year ago. The, the dark brown, which is the subject properties, are medium density apartment. Um, the red around that, you know, to the north and immediately to the, um, to the east, and it does actually, that designation goes beyond the, 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 the north-south extent of Charlotte. That is actually the neighborhood center. Um, designation and that designation is actually for higher density forms of development. This brown area as you can see here was intended to provide the transition between the neighborhood center to the north which it can accommodate mixed use densities uh, at a higher density with uh, potentially mid-rise and high-rise forms um, and the designation south of Charlotte and also moving eastward as you can see around the neighborhood center and that's for neighborhood attached residential. So while the properties to the south of Charlotte are currently single family, the vision here is that they would be redeveloped over time to a number of smaller multifamily projects, triplexes, quadruplexes, et cetera, even single family subdivisions. And it's part of that goal to incrementally densify um, those, um, that part of the neighborhood. Um, and uh, you can see that the, the southerly part, the, the neighborhood center immediately um, east of, of, of Charland, okay, that area is designated, that lower reach, by policy for a maximum of four-story, even in the neighborhood center. So the area plan did recognize essentially a four-story type of massing and control uh, between the neighborhood attached residential and other higher forms of density in that area. And that's what we have uh, uh, come forward with, uh, well, the proponents come forward with, but we're certainly uh, able to support that. Okay. Uh, she raised two other questions that I think I can answer. One of them had to do with, uh, I think you mentioned there's no sidewalk there and you're concerned about that. The plans that I have all show that there's going to be a sidewalk in front of the... On both sides of the street? Oh, I'm not sure on both, no, on the side of the street that the apartment building has been built on. Okay, how about shoulders for parking? For all the guests that come to the 88 building, which you guys probably only have about five stalls or something like that for an 88 uh, uh, unit building, there's not going to be enough visitor parking for that unit on that street because there's not, no, just what? with the houses right now, enough. Well, why, don't, why don't we ask, how many visitor spaces? Uh, with 88 units, you're going to get in the range of 18 units, 18 parking stalls, 18 visitor parking stalls. For 88 units uh, with probably two people uh, in each unit. Uh, the zoning bylaw does, does have a specific amount for visitor parking. This, this proponent is meeting all of the required visitor parking for the building based on approved zoning okay. uh, for the parking. Um, the, the, in terms of the improvements to the road, this proponent, this developer, would have to do full frontage improvements to the north part of Charlotte fronting their site. It's um, barrier, concrete curb, gutter, street trees, boulevard, the whole amount. They will also have to finish the cul-de-sac. On the south side, it would be, uh, there would be a transition to the south side. The south side is expected to be built um, and finished in terms of a finished standard when developments to the south get completed. But there would be a transition to that to make sure that there's a, a logical... Uh, I didn't quite get your last sentence, sir. You were saying that it's going to be finished on the south side when? When the properties on the south side of Charlotte, uh, like your property and others, that have a designation for neighborhood attached residential, when they come in for redevelopment, then that's part of the redevelopment of those properties. So that will be after your building that will be built? Uh, yeah, the, the, is that what you mean? The, the, the proponent of the property owner is responsible for essentially completing the roadway and the sidewalk on their side of the street. Uh, 
every every development is exactly the same. The, the property owner ends up doing their side of the street uh, according to the municipal bylaw. We can't. Well, right force, now, we can't there's no there's no parking in, hardly on on the south side of the street as it as it is now. And it won't change. Uh, so they're, they're I, I don't get where you think all these people are going to park. I just don't understand it. But we, as the people who own the houses on the other side of the street, are the ones that are going to have to put up with this. Uh, and you had one more question, and it had to do, you were concerned about the uh, shadows that the building would cast Yeah, on. that building is not really going to be a four-story building. Well, they already all, said that. Uh, okay. Um, I just want to explain, uh, as one of our, as the aerial map, as the aerial image showed as well, that building is to the north of... Um, of where you live, it's on the north side of the street, and all the shadows will be cast to the north or to the east and the west if at sunset and sunrise. There'll be no shadows cast to the south um, onto your property. Uh, so all the shadows get cast primarily during the day onto the, uh, commercial, the commercial property that's to the north. So that's, um, I don't think that should be a concern. Okay. Well, I hope you don't let this go through because it's ruining the neighborhood for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, next speaker is Luigi Solmona, 945 and 951 Shortland. That show is not. No, maybe it's not. Isn't it? Yeah, maybe. Looks an awful lot like. Good evening, Your Worship and Council. I'm Joel Simona here representing 945 and 951 Chairland. Um, I'd like to start by observing for Council's consideration the applicant's proposal could better contribute to the future of Austin Heights through a more sensitive configuration of the proposed investment. But just briefly, I'd like to talk a bit about our partnership group. And we need to start with we have quite a sentimental attachment to Coquitlam, which indeed uh, the applicant has noted in, in their correspondence too. This view uh, for us translates into a major financial investment in this community, and we bought quite a number of properties, rental homes, both in Austin Heights and Millardville. Professionally, we see a great future in this community, especially with your leadership and the new plans for Southwest Coquillum, and we're looking forward to Millardville uh, wrapping up so we can look at that some more. We are also very patient. We've been doing this for a long time, uh, and we, we believe in pursuing development when all the factors are right including ensuring our neighbors agree. And we have some of our neighbors here tonight, and as councils are usually familiar, some folks here are not very comfortable to speak. I can't speak for them, but I think the audience uh, is bigger than the people who will speak. What that means for council and the community, in our view, is we will be here for many years to come um, to support your vision, and you can certainly expect us to be here uh, sooner than the next 15 years. In terms of the land use, I'd like to start by observing for Council, we see general merit for Council to accept the applicant's RM3 proposal. Yet with the Council's success in obtaining the landmark tower at 955 Austin, which really is quite spectacular, um, we would suggest the next major investment in this area should even be more striking. Although this proposal may technically meet the Austin Heights Neighborhood Plan bylaws, with the 955 Austin, all of you set a much higher standard for this neighborhood, and that's why we invested. We would humbly offer that this demands a high degree of respect from all investors, including people like me, um, on the way forward. We might even go so far, and please excuse my liberty, but Council has a real opportunity here to have our neighbor, uh, and they are our neighbor, uh, we understand that, revisit their proposal to ensure that not only is this project right, but Council is able to send the right message to others. And that right message is a better proposal here will mean for everyone else bring high quality and that only those need apply. I think you all are aware good begets better and Coquitlam deserves no less and our community deserves that. We also very much understand uh, you're not here to serve folks like me, um, you're here to serve the community. And every project we do has uh, received the support of the community. And of course, uh, we need to build for future residents too. And as I mentioned, we'll be here uh, this year, next year, and the year after to help you do that. 
Our second observation, uh, which uh, my neighbors commented on, is really is how appropriate is the particular configuration the applicant has for this site, uh, which uh, certainly will influence our neighbors. Um, no matter how we slice this, this is still a 92 meter building, uh, 300 plus feet. Um, Council is all also very well aware of the challenge you faced a little while ago with a 19 story building. Uh, one of my neighbors observed to me uh, just recently that at, uh, this is a, the building application is a equivalent to a 30 story building and they made the observation the horizontal tower coming to Charland. Now we respect that all of you have a real challenging job and you got to balance a lot of things um, to get this all right. Uh, I have little expectation the applicant would agree with just this one view. Yet, um, we think the own public words from Lettingham McAllister appear to tell a different story than you've heard from them tonight. We submit uh, for council consideration a letter that we received um, uh, without redistribution restriction, so it's a public letter uh, to staff uh, that identifies how they're going to deal with this. They describe the, how the building length um, is 55 meters, but in fact, as the applicant did note verbally, your bylaw limit is 37 meters, and you can get to 55 meters with some breaks. Nonetheless, at 92 meters, you're a full two thirds over that limit. But I would strike, uh, there's a striking word in that letter that struck us immediately, is letting Ham McAllister believes that the community will be somehow uh, not notice by way of building design illusion, the length of their building. We also suggest for council consideration that only a few homeowners, in fact, I talked to one of my colleagues, sorry, one of my neighbors today, and they're the only one they, that will actually see the breezeway that's being proposed. The impact of this design for all of the south side owners, except uh, one of my neighbors who uh, I expect to speak in a moment, our tenants, uh, currently we have the two tenants at 945 and 951, and for any pedestrian or vehicle coming in at end, either end of the block, there will not be any illusion. The oblong view, and actually the applicant did show us an oblong view, there will not be any visual break along that uh, uh, from either end of the block. And indeed with some levity, uh, I'd suggest that maybe this, uh, and hopefully not, becomes the wall of West Coquilla. Seriously though, we applaud council. You faced a serious challenge uh, to build a consensus on the Austin Heights plan. And it includes best practice design guidelines, which by the way are part of the bylaw. I work globally now, and I have to say for Coquitlam, uh, both council and staff, you should be commended for the exceptional design solutions that the Austin Heights design guidelines uh, appear, and indeed I would be prepared to take them anywhere I work. But I'd have to observe, we respectfully maintain this proposal does not comply with council's design requirements. We note that council directs in the strongest terms all development must meet. Those, are don't sound, those words don't sound particularly optional to me. Um, that the wide portion of buildings north-south minimizing the width along the east-west elevation. And for obvious reasons, which my colleague, uh, my neighbor pointed out. By contrast, the approval for 955 Austin specifically identifies features to minimize the impact of shadowing, and certainly that's a much more challenging project. We'd also suggest, and in fact the applicant did observe uh, that um, council's design criteria doesn't just apply to Charland, it also will apply one day, hopefully soon, to 948 Austin, which is the Petro Canada site, site, which council has directed for higher density use indeed, is a landmark site similar to 955. Lettingham McAllister's design proposal would directly lead to the lower floors, uh, which are backing on the lane to this site, facing a near continuous building obstruction. So I think one of, your, one of the councillors asked this question. As we wrap up, uh, one observation I'd also make uh, for your consideration in receiving the package from, from uh, staff is we have insuffi insufficient information to understand the reasons for the site coverage variance, uh, which was explained to some degree this evening. While we have no knowledge of our neighbor's subsurface oil, soil conditions, it seems from uh, that we see that the construction project will retain, and I think we heard that tonight, that the potential hazards under this structure, instead of removing them, 
like responsible um, uh, developers. In fact, the 955 Austin had to deal with this and has dealt with it quite well. From our perspective, in permitting the structure to remain so far out of the ground, we'll create a building shadow uh, on the west side of the building, which will affect our current tenants and any future 948 Austin residents should that approval occur there. In any event, uh, we will be, uh, now that we have some additional information tonight, we will pr be proceeding tomorrow to ensure that our neighbor um, is not causing any harm to our tenants, uh, either now or into the future. I'd like just one last observation. We want to make sure that we leave no wrong impression here. Um, in principle, we commend the applicant for this investment. This is a multi-million dollar investment. However, we believe a responsibility exists to deliver a better configuration. We also recognize should we, uh, me and my business partnership group, ever come in front of you, we'll be held to some very high standards. And I don't think um, we would be expected to be treated any differently, and the community expects and deserves that. In conclusion, uh, we believe that Council has wisely chosen a leadership path for Austin Heights, which has directly led to our considerable investment over the last two or three years. We also believe and respectfully submit that Council can adopt a balanced approach here that enable, excuse me, enables the applicant's proposal to move forward to the next stage of evaluation, but with better respect for the future of Austin Heights. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Jeff, okay. your eight minutes is up. <laughs> Councillor O'Neill, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Simona. Um, I'm having trouble understanding um, your comment about uh, pedestrians or cars entering from either the east or the west end of Charlotte, seeing one continuous block. I don't see how. So I'll just hold up two things here. Let's say these are the two blocks of the, the two parts of the building. Whether they're connected by a, a small connecting structure or not, from an acute angle from either the east or the west, it's going to seem like one building. Well, that's actually what I meant. So, I'm sorry, Your Worship. That's actually what I meant. Is it from but one? It so it doesn't matter then whether they're separated or not. So if, 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 you're, if you're looking at these two, look, looking at these mm -hmm. two from this angle, coming at the east or the west end, it looks like one continuous building. You don't see the opening until you get right in front of it. That's right. And so, so whether or not there's that connecting bridge between the two buildings wouldn't make a difference from, for that point. Um, Your Worship, if I could respond? Yes, absolutely. Um, the observation I make, we're not here to help design uh, the neighbor's building. Our point is that there needs to be a more sensitive solution that deals with your approved bylaws, which uh, provide for a north-south uh, orientation. And uh, one other point on the uh, one of your last points you made, and uh, maybe we can get some direction from staff here, regarding um, possible contaminated soil. Um, it's my understanding that uh, one of the remedies to contaminate soil isn't to remove it, but it's to isolate it and to provide barriers to keep it in place, and that's quite a common thing. And I presume that, that there's going to be a barrier here instead of removing uh, the material. Is that correct? Your Worship, uh, yes, that is correct. We, um, we do rely on qualified professionals. It depends on the contamination levels, the type of contamination. Is it groundwater? Is it actual soils? Um, all of these factors go into the analysis of the qualified professional. There's a bona fide treatment methods on site. Sometimes there's barriers put up. Those are all bona fide, and we would rely on the qualified professionals and the sign-off from the Ministry of Environment. If a certificate of compliance is granted by the Ministry, we would accept that as a basis for the development. Thank you. I think I know where Councillor O'Neill was going with one element of that, and I'm going to ask, what is the side yard setback, the setback from the um, west side of the property. I realize we're, we're delving into issues here that are development permit issues, not zoning issues, but um, we're starting down that path anyway. So uh, the side yard setback, Your Worship, is four and a half meters. So there's four and a half meters between the property line, and I assume it's the property line with your property, and the building. So typically it'd be a nine meter separation between buildings, if you okay. will. On, how, much on, is the, how much is the separation between the two halves of this building? It, it, at, it varies, but it, it, uh, at a large part of that opening, it's, it's uh, 10 meters. So it's essentially a large part of that, that separation between the buildings. And it does vary. It goes from somewhere around 6 to 10 meters because there's, there's a part of the, the stairwell in the back. 
but a, a large part of that opening between the buildings is the same or slightly more than would be the case if it was two separate buildings. That's so, part of the rationale that staff had around the design. Understood. So um, if the adjacent property, whoever owns it, were to be developed into a four-story apartment building, um, the arguments that applied to this gap would apply to the gap between the, that building and the adjacent building, that perhaps it would look like one continuous building. That's exactly correct, Your Worship. Bar barring enormous changes to the yes. exterior design or something. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's always a challenge in providing enough of a side yard to appear to be broken up if you're looking at it from the wrong angle. Uh, and this does appear like you've made that attempt to have the same kind of a, a separation. So, uh, did you have is that good for you? That's it. Yes, Thank sir. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Now that's the end of my speakers list. Are there any other speakers to this item? Please come forward. You have to state your name and your address for the record, please. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Ranjit Campbell. I have a home at uh, 960 Charland and live uh, with my three sons and um, two parents right across the street from the proposed development. I built my home less than five years ago and had the desire to live close to all the amenities that the Austin Heights neighborhood has to offer. I could walk to the Safeway, walk to the bank, uh, walk to the pub and liquor store, which they subsequently closed, <laughs> but they did open one at the pub. Uh, it also has a medical lab, which I could go to and walk as well. So I intended to live in that neighborhood for a long time in my aging years as uh, all the aging population. So I was even happier to learn about the new Austin Heights neighborhood plan and it all that I would have to offer. Greener space, newer restaurants, finer retail stores. When I found that the multi-story building would be built across the street, I said that would be great that the area was going to have new development. I am not against the development proposed, but I do have a few concerns. Uh, as someone mentioned here, our particular street here is supposed to be a transitional from the high rise to the to the low rise and then to the residential. So as Beverly said, one side of the street is going to be these apartments and the other is residential. So what I would like to see is more of a transition to that residential. Instead of this uh, large 88 unit, five, six story with two levels of parking, be reconsidered, reconfigured, <coughs> so it would be more of a transition. As you said, there are some, lots of nice homes on this, on the south side of the street, including mine. Uh, also, in terms of the parking, or not the parking, in terms of this uh, opening up the cul-de-sac, uh, the access from Austin all the way around to Charland, uh, I really don't see any reason why that, would, that would increase the traffic in our in our street as well. So I don't know, I don't understand what the need for that would be. Uh, I know they said it's only a one-way street, but they, people would still go down Austin, then down to Le Bleu and, and around. So I guess they're trying to get access to their property from both sides, from the east and the west side of Charlotte. And in respect to the parking, I don't understand why the parking has to be on Charlotte itself. Why it could not be in the back lane there? So the, we, it doesn't affect uh, the residents of Charlotte. Uh, that's all about I have to I have to say. So, uh, just in closing, um, please consider the changes to the building. And thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hodge. A couple of questions that uh, the residents just raised. Not uh, to staff. Um, is the um, the opening of uh, Charlotte onto La Bleu um, is that needed? Or is this just an opportunity to make a change? Or I'm just sort of wondering, obviously, with this number of units here, there's going to be a, a traffic change in this neighborhood. Uh, and I'm also wondering um, if, and I know we don't normally come in, I guess, from lane access, but moving the access to the back, does that move the traffic to the back and then we don't need to open Charlotte? I'm just wondering if we can have to sort of a, walk me through. Or is it the lanes are just too narrow, so we have to have an entry from the front? Um, yes, Your Worship, uh, so the two issues, the lane, first of all, 
the lane, uh, because of the grade, uh, so the, the top, uh, the lane is on the top, the road's on the bottom, actually accessing the parkade from that part, from the lane, is very, very difficult. You're chasing the grade. So typically you want to access the, the parkade from the lower side, so that is the optimal. Otherwise, it'd be a significant change, potentially undoable. Uh, we find this kind of grade uh, very prohibitive in those cases. Um, the lane is going to be improved. It will become a, an eight-meter lane ultimately. Uh, the current proponent will be expanding the lane. Um, uh, I believe yeah, there's about a 1.7-meter uh, addition dedication. Uh, they will be improving it, and then the ultimate development of the gas station to the north would complete the other half of the eight-meter principal access lane. So that lane will function for some additional traffic and volumes. Um, so that's the one question. The second question on the opening up of Charland, uh, we had considerable discussions with the uh, transportation planning group. Um, the opening of Charland for one-way traffic is intended to support the entire ultimate development of Charland with additional multifamily both on this site and the site on the north of Charland to the immediate west, but also future multifamily projects to the, um, to the south um, as they occur. Because of the size of this development, it was felt that it would make sense to open that up uh, for one-way traffic now. And uh, that is the plan, to distribute traffic and provide access without actually um, creating a, a, you know, an opportunity for, for rat running through this area for uh, motorists to try to avoid the Blue Mountain-Austin um, intersection coming through here and, and heading up. Uh, so there's a considerable amount of work done in analyzing that and that desired distribution. Um, to date, the discussion from engineering has been that it would be done on, on essentially opening day of this development. Could, could I, Bridge Your Worship, could I address that? I'd like to hear some. If you yeah. have some clarification on that, yeah. go ahead. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, I don't know the gentleman's name, but he keeps talking about development on south on the south side of Charlotte. Well, right now there's there's about six, seven houses, and four or five of those have been recently built. So I don't see any real development down there for a considerable amount of time. And in terms of access to, uh, like the parking lot can't be at the back of the lane, uh, what about the idea of having the access on Le Bleu itself? There's, because the, the building does go right onto Le Bleu, and Le Bleu is, is there's no residential houses on Le Bleu. So maybe consider yeah. that no, as an option. It's, uh, I, I, Actually, I was posing the same question to myself as to maybe there is a solution that comes off that end. Um, Councillor Hodge, you're done? No, I, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'd like to sort of, and not necessarily tonight, and I, I understand that the development zoning isn't uh, based on that, that that's just a future plan and that we can proceed with zoning change without dealing with roads and we can deal with the, the traffic issue at another time. But uh, I, I do see the potential for some uh, traffic management issues. Thank you. Okay. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you. The, um, the discussion about the improvement of the lane um, led me to wonder whether or not there's going to be any uh, possibility of parking on the lane, um, perhaps to satisfy some of the neighborhood concerns. And it would especially satisfy if there's going to be um, any pedestrian access. Uh, from the lane into the building, directly into the building, at the back of the building, on the north side of the building. Um, so uh, if not, I mean, why do we even care if the lane is improved, if it really can't be used by the people in the building? I wish uh, the, the, the lane is going to have direct access to all the units on the lane. It's going to be a very urban lane. Uh, there are going to be units facing the north that will have direct access. So just those... Um, Maybe it's 15 or so at, at ground level. Correct. They'll be direct, but not. Uh, there won't be a, an entrance in the middle of the building to the to the lobby or anything like so that. You worship. There is going to be an access to the from from the lane to the project uh, to the common area. We would expect that that would be designed like the other public part of the lane. Uh, the eight-meter lane ultimately is intended to function to, for commercial loading. Uh, there would be, we expect, and to the north, the gas station would have a high-rise, multifamily, mixed-use development long-term. So we do need that eight meters to to function, but not not to provide parking um, for for the those buildings, but to function as a as a multi-traveled uh, uh, area for multiple services, et cetera. But at least with the uh, access of the north side of the building, there is potential for people to park in other areas, not directly on Charlotte visitors, 
and uh, would not have to walk all the way around to the south side front of the building. If they were parking somewhere to the north uh, on the blue or somewhere else, it would be mm -hmm. easier for them. So, so I think that answers one of the concerns that all the, all the visitor parking wouldn't be piling up on Charland if there's access at the back of the building. Am I right in assuming that? Good, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Good evening. Um, my name is Phil Johnston, and I'm a current resident of 961 Charland Avenue, which is one of the homes that is in part of the proposed development. And I just have a few observations. Um, I was actually involved in the public advisory group for the Austin Heights um, plan. And um, from the very beginning, there was a real sense of community here. And um, there were a couple things that came out of that. Um, young families aging in place, affordability were all real touch points for that um, public advisory group and um, all of the public hearings, or at least, uh, sorry, the um, public events that went with that, there was a lot of concern for those issues. And um, I think from what I've seen from this proposal from Lettingham McAllister, they are meeting most of those concerns in this development. They're smaller units, it's wood frame buildings, it's um, got affordability written all over it, and I hope they come through with the pricing to match. Um, but you know, those are the, the real positive things I see. Um, I've lived there 21 years. You know, my children have known no other home, and um, it's been a really great place. We've had great neighbors, and um, yeah, it's just been a very special place to be, and we haven't moved very far away. So, um, But there is some concern about traffic coming from onto Charland, if they open that up and that, is there provision for controlling traffic from the pub and stuff from coming up Charland instead of going out onto Austin or back onto Nelson? So can I ask that question as how that how that's handled if you're going to open up Charland? Uh, if the speaker can just clarify, the, the opening up of Charland is strictly for southbound traffic heading west on Charlotte. So if you're heading southbound on Le Bleu, you would, you would come into a, a kind of a, a dedicated right turn okay. lane only and then right. you could head right into Charlotte. I think his question is if I'm leaving, right now, if I'm you leaving the right pub, down, can, you, can you so use that route? Yeah. Um, that's, uh, that has not come up in the discussions with our, with our transportation planning group. We can certainly talk to them about that, um, that traffic pattern. Um, uh, right we'd, we'd have come to come out of the pub and, and, and in the back south. alley, and they rat race come. down the back alley, mm. and um, okay. you don't want to be on that alley. Okay. Um, so second thing in there, so the traffic, that, that is a concern. If I'm, you know, that community, I know that community, I, you don't want people coming out of the pub and, and down Charland, so I don't know how you control that. But then you also have the access to the blue down, and then you cut across behind the Rona, and they've got the back alley that goes right across down behind the fire hall as well. So you've got a lot of different things you're trying to do with traffic in a pretty small space there. Um, the other big advantage, and, and one of the things I wonder about is, this is a major development on a small street. And you're going to have great sidewalks and lights and all the rest of it on the development side of the street, but you're asking the residents on the south side of the street to absorb an awful lot of fuss and bother over the construction period and they're really not going to get a lot out of it on their side of the street. And I wonder if there isn't some way of making the improvements on the street on both sides as part of this development, because that would make sense for this community. And um, I think that pretty much covers what I had to say. It's been a great, great neighborhood. And um, you know, a couple years farther down the road, why perhaps we would have considered buying a place there. We certainly did consider the tower across the street and uh, we may see what the next tower brings. Anyway, thank you very much, Council. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? I have a question. Just, if you could just hang on a second and we'll just we'll go through any other speakers that there might be. We'll, we'll include you at the end. Are there any other speakers to this item at all? Any other speakers? Third and final time. Okay, we've got one speaker left, so go right ahead. Councillor Reed, do you have a question? Yeah, through to engineering or um, 
Charlotte, is is it a regular sized street? Well, yeah, you're well, driving down it, it's kind of skinny, so I'm trying to ask. Uh, your, your Worship, Charlotte would be a local street. Um, I, I don't know what the exact widths are of that particular street. I'd have to rely on development staff for that. But it, it would be classed as a local street. Okay. So it will have a sidewalk, um, which won't affect the street width on either side, correct? Uh, yes, correct. The, the street is uh, a little bit over... For a sidewalk on both sides. The, the, the road ultimately, it's a 20 meter plus road, so it's a full 20 meter dedication. I think it's 20 and a half. Okay. Uh, the ultimate pavement is 11 meters. It's essentially a collector standard road, which is how we'll build it long term. That's so it essentially would have parking on both sides, two travel lanes, curb, boulevard, street trees, sidewalks, okay. separated from the concrete curb and landscaping in behind. It's a full collector standard. Uh, but we'll only build, uh, the developer will only build the north half as part of this development. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for the explanation, there's a local road. Collector is a little bit wider. So. Hi, Beverly Sears again. Um, yep. Just wanted to add again about opening up Charlene Street. Um, that was open at one time. Yeah. And um, this was before I moved into the neighborhood, so I've been in the neighborhood now nine years and there was so much trouble with that road opened uh, noise uh, probably people coming from the bar uh, being drunk and driving um, we had uh, four months ago a drunk driver come down from the bar and drive into the house at on the other side of the cul-de-sac at Le Bleu um, I see this as a danger situation with that street being opened up I see it as a noise uh, situation also. Um, I do like the idea of uh, my neighbor who mentioned that possibly uh, people could, they could change their building so that the parking could come in off of Le Bleu. I don't see the point of opening up that street for anything, especially when the neighbors worked so hard just to close it. I would say they probably did it about 10 years ago. It's like a year or so before I moved in. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Reed. Just the reason they just one moment. Just one moment, please. We'll activate Councillor Reed's microphone, and then Councillor O'Neill's next. The reason that the street was closed was exactly what um, this lady said. I used to work in that plaza, and we had more drunk drivers coming around that corner. We had a lot of robberies at that time in the plaza, and that this is where the kids would go in their cars, and be back in, in behind there. Um, the other problem that you get in there is the people leaving Rona, the, the building and coming out that little road. And um, I, I really don't know why we have to open Charland up at all. I really don't see it. It just makes no sense at all to me. If we're going to be later developing the lane behind there, you have access and egress from Blue Mountain. I, to open Charland up just opens up a whole box of problems. It really does, unless you're going to close the access to um, the Rona uh, shopping center off, where there'd be nowhere for folks to go other than if they were accessing one of these. So I have difficulty with the engineering. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, it's, um, is there a traffic light at, uh, uh, I was down, down the street a few months ago and looking at this when it first came to our attention. Is there a traffic light at Blue Mountain and Charland? I can't remember. No. Okay. So I would think that um, with, uh, with, with a building this size with that many new people in there that all the traffic that would be, let's say, coming from Low Heat Mall going eastbound along Austin, if it wanted to get back into that apartment, uh, right now it would have to turn right, which is south on Blue Mountain, and left across a busy street into Charlotte without a traffic light. So it would make a lot more sense for them to keep going along Austin, turn right down the Blue, then right into Charlotte without having to cross over a very busy uh, street without a traffic light. So perhaps if, if in somebody's wisdom that Charlotte does remain closed, I think with, uh, and if this uh, development goes through, then there should be a traffic light at Charlotte and Blue Mountain um, with all that extra traffic there. Otherwise, 
having Charlotte closed and no traffic light with all that no, those new people there doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. That would be quite dangerous. I hope everybody followed that. I've got them sort of. Okay, sorry. I'm going too fast. Does the uh, assistant director of or do the planning people understand what I was saying? Uh, yes, uh, Your Worship, uh, Councillor O'Neill. Yes, I absolutely uh, agree with um, or understood your comments. Um, if I may paraphrase, and, and I guess I, what I would say is that this issue, the, the, the current thinking around traffic volumes is precisely the issue that you've just raised, that if you don't have access to Charland, at least an inbound, southbound from Le Bleu into this neighborhood, that there would be limited movements limited to obviously Blue Mountain and Charlotte. It's, uh, there's a little bit of, of uh, the curvature, the angle, the, 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 the road steepness. So the idea would be that you do want a distribution of traffic to be able to access the area. That was the, the wisdom behind the, the uh, engineering um, position at the moment, which is to open up. Um, but we could certainly take council's direction and um, should this move forward under council direction, um, we could provide specific information on this issue and, and a definitive position around um, full traffic volumes, what would happen if we don't have access to, to Charlotte southbound um, as part of the, the additional information uh, through the development permit, um, if, if Council so wishes. But at this point, that is the wisdom from engineering. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm struggling with that, too. I don't know that this building is... is uh, reason enough to open up Charlotte in any way, but I'm also left with the challenge that I, you know, having given it some thought, I can't imagine um, having a building whose address is on Charlotte, having a building whose name is is Charlotte, and then saying that you better go to La Blue Street to get at it, and because that would be the access to the visitors' parking as well, uh, I assume. So I don't know that we can have an entrance off La Blue, and that leaves us with. Uh, unless you had access from the, to that entrance from Charlotte, then that defeats the purpose. I, th I still think I'm still reluctant to see us open up Charlotte uh, in any way. Um, uh, I can I can see what I grew up. Uh, I've lived all this all my life in this community, and Charlotte was in fact a shortcut. Um, if, if, if there was if there was traffic at the top of the hill, uh, uh, this goes back to the days when Blue Mountain was two lanes. Um, Charlotte, you go Charlotte and Le Bleu, um, and uh, you, I don't, I don't think we want that. And I certainly don't, wouldn't want the traffic, the commercial traffic from the um, shopping center and pub, to be using Charlotte to get out. Uh, so um, I, I can't see that solution unless you decided that there was a different bulb or some different uh, configuration that the shopping center could only go north. Um, but shy of that, um, I'm really reluctant to see that. So. Okay. Uh, one. Go ahead. So uh, just a final question on that issue. Is a, a traffic light at Blue Mountain and Charlotte technically feasible? No, it's definitely not. Sorry. I don't like traffic lights. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Souza, sure, tell him it's not. Sure, Your Worship. Uh, uh, of course it's uh, technically, uh, probably, I would say probably technically feasible uh, coordination could occur with another light, for example. However, uh, signal lights are uh, subject to uh, really a rational warrant analysis and, and uh, from what I can tell from the size of this development and the general um, land use of, of the surrounding area, um, my judgment is that uh, uh, putting a, a traffic signal like there would, would rate a relatively low warrant. Thank you. Yeah, it's also relatively close to the entrance to the church across the street and uh, those sorts of things. So. Okay, I'll do it one more time. Are there any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Seeing none. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, kayakers can be older. I'm myself an <laughs> avid kayaker, uh, and my son loves it as well. And uh, one day, uh, my 11-year-old, we were buying him shoes at Zeller's, and I noticed the lady in front of me, she got a discount for being a senior. Yeah, it's 55 and older, so I stepped right up, and I got my discount too. So seniors can be kayakers. Uh, I also just 
wanted to touch briefly on, on a few things. Uh, if we could put the landscape plan up again of the... Thank you. Uh, I just want to note on the plan that if you, a lot of the building was shifted to the north to be to closer to the lane with the thought being we would try and keep the building an extra 10, most of the building an extra 10 feet further away from the people on the south side of the street. And then the question of the north-south orientation on Le Bleu, actually you'll see there's a longer projection of the building and working with your staff, because the streets that spilled down north-south, they wanted a more urban character. Actually, we've made sure that the homes all have access to Le Bleu to create a eyes on the street and, and doors on the street. We also did actually study ourselves the question of putting the parking entry off Le Bleu. And because it slopes quite a bit, about nine feet from Le Bleu, from Charland up to the lane, um, you really, if there were to be a driveway, you'd want it at the midpoint between the two to avoid conflicts with people coming out of the lane, especially since it's supposed to be a higher volume lane. We're actually dedicating parts of our site because the lane is adjacent to commercial. It's, it's not our project that needs the wider lane. It's, be, mm -hmm. it's the price for being next to a commercial, which is fine. We, we've ma made it work. Uh, but it does mean there's more volume of traffic coming in out of the lane. And also the other question we grappled with is if we put an entry off to Le Bleu, I guess we are entering into an area where there is traffic from the shopping center from the pub, various things, and, and it's just going to, I, we, we believe, would add to the confusion. So we felt moving it as far away from that intersection, having the parking entry there, uh, was, was continued to be sort of the logical location. Uh, what, uh, final thing about the south side, there's some talk of whether the south side of the street should be improved with curbs, gutters, and brought up to a city standard. Um, one of the downsides of that would be is a lot of the residents are currently have their driveways right out to the extended paving area and are able to use that area to sort of park two cars or one car pointing into their homes. If the, curb, if the street is widened to its actual proper design, the curb would move quite a ways back from where the driving surface is now. And so we'd be, it gets in a sense, they would lose parking that they have now that creates utility to create parking that's parallel parking. So it probably would be, in terms of parking, a net zero equation. Uh, I thought we'd just point that out. Thank you. Is there any other questions council may have? No, well, perpendicular parking is actually technically against a different bylaw, but uh, I don't see any questions. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. And Councillor Sakora and Councillor Reed want to point out that they don't want to give up their canoe for the kayak, so. It was a joke. Are there any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Any other speakers to this item? Seeing none. I declare this item closed. Thank you. Ms. Madam Clerk. <laughs> Item 2 is an application to amend or revise the land use designation and zoning of the property at 1440 Dayton Street. Your Worship and members of Council, my name is Michael Dollywell, development planner with the City. The subject site is located north of the approved Polygon Townhouse development site on Highland Drive and on the west side of Dayton Street between Horizon Drive and Highland Drive. The site is designated conventional townhouse, an environmentally sensitive area, and the adjacent site to the south and west is designated conventional townhouse, an environmentally sensitive area. The sites to the north and east are designated small village, single family. Zoning on the site and to the south and west is RT2, townhouse residential, and P5 special park. Zoning to the north is RS7, small village, single family, and P5 special park. And to the east is RS2, one family, suburban residential. The applicant seeks to redesignate the site, conventional townhouse, and small village, single family, an environmentally sensitive area, and rezone the site to RS7, small village single family, RT2, townhouse residential, 
and P5 Special Park. This is in order to accommodate the development of five single-family lots fronting Devonshire Avenue, a streamside protection area, and one townhouse parcel containing one single-family house fronting Dayton Street. Staff are recommending all final readings to OCP Amendment Bylaw Number 4333-2012 and Zoning Amendment Bylaw 4334-2012. Staff are also recommending Council require the owner to provide 5% cash in lieu in association with the subdivision apl application to acquire parkland. Okay. I have nobody. No. Are there any speakers for this item? Are there any speakers for this item? Third and final time, are there any speakers for this item? Declare this item closed. That concludes the items on the public hearing Bigger agenda. Pardon? That concludes the items yes. on the public hearing agenda. Okay. Well, um, We'll adjourn the public hearing and in a couple of minutes we'll start up a city council meeting to deal with tonight's agenda. <laughs>